SpaceX Falcon 9 and a rare Minotaur C launch now on Kinews. Hey Lucas here, welcome to Kenews for week 44 and as always a big shout out to my Kenews boosters who support me on Patreon. Thanks for your thrust. It's been a while guys, but there were no launches in the past two weeks and I decided to work on a special episode which is not yet finished. SpaceX will kick off this week launching from Cape Canaveral and landing their first stage booster again back on their drone ship out in the ocean. This happened yesterday at 1934 UTC and you can re-watch it following the link in the info box. On top of the expandable upper stage is KoreaSat 5A, a communication satellite for South Korea's only satellite operator KTSAT. It will be placed at a geosynchronous slot at 113 degrees east and cover many countries from East to West Asia including Japan, the Philippines, Thailand but also the southern parts of India, Pakistan, Iran and Saudi Arabia. During launch it gets covered by a 5 meter weight fairing which keeps the atmospheric pressure away from it. What makes this rocket unique is of course its reusable booster which is able to guide itself like a missile towards a drone ship using grid fins and control thrusters up top. The complete rocket stands 70 meters tall on the launch pad which I actually find hard to appreciate in the live streams due to the lack of a commonly known reference. Falcon will tilt east just a few seconds after takeoff and reach its maximum stress levels at 1 minute and 16 seconds into flight. This is typically the most critical phase during flight since this is where flaws in the rocket body could potentially destroy the rocket. However, Falcon is a little different and its two explosive anomalies occurred either long before or after the event. They were actually related to some issues on the upper stage and not the first stage booster itself. Speaking of it, the booster will shut down its engines and separate from the upper stack once it's almost out of fuel. It will, while the rest continues to a geosynchronous transfer orbit, rotate around, re-enter back into the atmosphere at over 8000 km per hour. To avoid serious damage, the booster also has to perform a rather expensive re-entry burn using three of its nine Merlin engines. It then hits the low atmosphere still at 6000 km per hour, which is still enough to make the grid fins and probably also the nozzles glow brightly. Once at this point, everything advances rather quickly until the rocket stands upright and hopefully in one piece on the drone ship. These landings look spectacular but are of course only the first step to full and rapid reusability. Shipping a booster across the ocean takes several days which is not what SpaceX plans for the future. Their Falcon Heavy rocket will for example have enough capability to return all booster cores back to the launch site instead of landing out in the ocean. But of course, it's not there yet and while the three cores have been tested on ground already, SpaceX still has to wait for a launch pad to become available. Their old pad, which burnt up, will open in December and while the chances are rather low to see a launch this year, I still have some hopes to see it lift off before Christmas. We'll see. The upper stage will do two burns, separated by a lengthy coasting phase in which it will just float around on a ballistic trajectory through space. Reignition of the single Merlin engine is the most critical phase here but was never an issue so far. If I have understood correctly, it fires its control thrusters just before ignition so that the floating fuel inside the tanks rushes towards the engine's turbo pump. There it gets spun up and pressed through tiny injectors into the combustion chamber. This is by the way a similar technique to how SpaceX wants to refuel their future spaceships in orbit. Both will use their control thrusters to generate an artificial gravity towards the empty one. Once the ships fly on a regular basis, SpaceX could build up a rotary refueling station in low earth orbit. The full ships would dock at the center, transfer their fuel into the core belt and from there it would rush into the tanks of ships docked to the outer ring, all thanks to the fuel's inertia. However, this method is certainly not perfect and just completely made up by me. I'm not sure if it would be any feasible due to the fuel's boil off. Do you maybe have a better idea on how to transfer cryogenic propellants in space? You can share them in the comments and maybe I can make an animation out of it unless of course you want to patent them. Anyways, once KoreaSat 5A is released it will continue on its own and circleize its orbit over the course of several weeks before it can begin its mission to cover the ground with communication services. Next up to launch is a Minotaur C on Halloween at 2137 UDC. It will launch from Wandenberg at the US West Coast so the candy grind will be accompanied by some fitting spooky rumble. 
On top Orbital ADK's rocket is as always a payload, which is not a pumpkin, but 6 micro and some cubesats. 6 so called skysats for the subsidiary Terrabella, formerly known as Skybox Imaging, and 4 from type Flak 3M for Planet Labs themselves. All these are imaging satellites, which join their fleet, which already delivers updated imagery of pretty much every place around the globe on a daily basis. The goal is to keep track of changes almost instantly like new roads for navigation systems, floods and fires in remote areas and many other things. It's of course not free to use and companies have to pay for using it. However, they release some cool pictures on their Twitter once in a while similar to Digital Globe. I can highly recommend to follow them and while you're at it, follow me too to not miss all the crazy animations I share. The Minotaur launcher has 4 solid fuel stages and is overall very similar to the European Vega rocket. It stands 27.9 meters tall and has a very sad 66% success rate. 3 of its 9 launches failed, including the last 2 in 2009 and 2011. Both failures were caused by the nose fairing, which did not jettison, dooming the satellites on board. Yep, a similar failure to the recent Indian one. The first one was by the way caused by the second stage engine gimbal, which decided to sleep for 5 seconds. Surprisingly, the rocket recovered, but lost precious speed, thus failed to reach orbit. The launch of Minotaur is also quite spectacular, because it has a high thrust to weight ratio of 2.2 at liftoff. What this means is, it shoots 4 times more quickly into the sky than a Falcon 9 with a thrust to weight ratio of only 1.3 for example. In order to compare the launch quicknesses, you have to subtract 1 because that's what Earth's gravity swallows. Left over are 0.3 for Falcon and 1.2 for Minotaur, pushing the rockets upwards. Minotaur's high acceleration makes the rocket more efficient because it spends less time fighting Earth's gravity and reaches space quicker than most other rockets. This is important because solid fuels themselves have a rather low efficiency when it comes to the exhaust speed and the rockets would otherwise not be able to reach orbit. This is something KSP actually teaches. Solid boosters work best with a high thrust weight ratio and throttling them down to achieve the typical 1.3 makes these rockets less capable as if you kept it at 2 or more. Once all of Minotaur's 4 stages burned out, the payloads will hopefully be able to detach and begin their missions to finally bring an end to the rocket's unlucky streak. Ok, that shall conclude this week's episode and I hope to see you in the next one if you like. Happy Halloween guys! Auf Wiedersehen and thank you for watching.